like to do is put out four pieces of evidence and then reflect on them and then do my so what piece. So uh, the first and longest piece of evidence as such um, is from this book, Is There a Text in This Class uh, by Stanley Fish? And it uh, is in the middle of an anecdote that he tells and it starts on page uh, 324. And what he's done is told this story about how he used to teach two classes back to back. And in the first class, he was teaching linguistics. And in the second class, he was teaching medieval Christian poetry. And at the end of his linguistics class one day, he had written a series of names on the board. And they were the last names of linguists. And something struck his fancy. And in between the first and second class, when the students were kind of coming in and out, he put a box around the list of last names. And he said to his students in the, Christian, the medieval Christian poetry class, what you see on the board is a Christian poem from that period. I would like you to please interpret it as such. The first line of the poem received the most attention. Jacob's was explicated as a reference to Jacob's ladder, traditionally allegorized as the figure for Christian ascent to heaven. In this poem, however, or so my students told me, the means of ascent is not a ladder, but a tree, a rose tree, or Rosenbaum. This was seen as an obvious reference to the Virgin Mary, who was often characterized as a rose without, a rose without thorns, itself an emblem of the Immaculate Conception. At this point, the poem appeared to the students to be operating in the familiar manner of an iconographic riddle. It at once posed the question, how is it that a man can climb to heaven by means of a rose tree, and directed the reader to the inevitable answer, by the fruit of that tree, the fruit of Mary's womb, Jesus Christ. And so he goes through to talk a little bit about how they interpret the rest of it and to say that he's um, done this experiment now many different kinds of places and that he gets similar results. People are able to interpret it when he tells them it is a poem. And so he asks this question on 325. What is the source of that ability to interpret the poem that way? How is it they were able to do what they did? What is it that they did? These questions are important because they bear directly on the question often asked in literary theory. What are the distinguishing features of literary language? Or, to put the matter more colloquially, how do you recognize a poem when you see one? Second piece of information to share with you. This image appeared last week in newspapers around Methuen, Massachusetts. It is the image of Jesus Christ as appeared to a woman there. And this woman believed that this image appeared to her because she'd been having some down times and she uh, burned some things on her iron accidentally, making her day even worse. And when she picked up the iron, she saw that, in fact, it was the face of Jesus. And this woman then said that she and her daughters understood the image to be proof that God was listening. Third piece of uh, news that I heard recently, and I will put a link to it on theimageoffish.com on this post down below, but some significant research into how it is that Mexican sociologists and American, from the United States of America, sociologists do sociology differently. That is to say, what constitutes proof of something for a sociologist in the United States is different than a sociologist who's working in Mexico. So even if they both speak fluent English or Spanish, when speaking to one another, when they say that something was proven or it is a sociological fact that dot dot dot, they're actually like ships crossing in the night and they don't mean the same things. And I won't get into the specifics of it, but the meta research was done that said that the way that sociologists in these two countries go about creating knowledge is so different that when they speak to each other, they're not actually talking about the same thing. Fascinating article for those of you that are interested in this kind of thing. I'll link to it down below. Fourth and final piece is a paraphrased quote from James H. Evans Jr., in whose presence I was lucky enough to be when he said this gem. The question, to me, whenever it is that Jesus Christ appears, either on a cave wall, a potato chip, a cloud, or the face of an iron, is not immediately whether or not it is Jesus Christ that has appeared, but why it is that the image, mystically appearing, of any bearded, long-haired, 30-year-old man must be Jesus Christ. 
Why, I ask, could it not be Che Guevara? So, often we confuse our interpretation of something for the thing itself. So, for example, in the case of the woman and the iron, um, she says, it is proof that Jesus is listening. She doesn't say, to me it means that Jesus is listening. She says, it is something. Similarly, when um, Stanley Fish asks his students, what does this poem mean? They respond not with, I think it means so-and-so, but it means this. Um, and I think that uh, the sociological reading of the world by uh, American and, and Mexican sociologists suggests that they have their own sense of what it means to prove something and what it means to uh, do sociology. And so again, the, the comment is that it is often the case that we confuse our interpretation of something with the thing itself. And this is a fascinating human occurrence because it seems like it's a pretty small issue of semantics to say, oh, something is something, you know, that iron is proof of that versus to me it means that the iron uh, is proof of that. But there's a whole world of difference between those two things. And it strikes me that a lot of what happens in Christian discourse that is uh, problematic and the butting of heads is simply the difference between those two statements. To me, it means that, da 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 da, -da and it is the case that, da 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 da, -da. Now, now, maybe I don't under understand because um, my tradition is less creedal and dogmatic and theological than other folks, but it seems as if, if we just began to speak with it, to me it seems that, and allowed for some, some humbleness and understanding that we are interpreting the world and it's not pure and unadulterated to us, and no matter what our situation, our community helps us understand what it is that we're doing, um, then we might be able to be a little bit more... Uh, humble and easy to work with. So uh, an hour and uh, 45 minutes or so has passed since I made the first part and over the interim I had dinner with my housemates and was talking about the so what and it turns out the so what for this time uh, isn't a statement it's a question and it goes a little something like this. Are there things that we're sure of or that we say we're sure of, that really we just wish were the case for us? And what would change in the world if we admitted that there are some things that we wanted to claim as certainly true that we simply just thought was true? Now, I have a problem even with my own question because I call all the time for us to be faithful and to believe in something even though we have no proof. And, and yet at the same time, I, that seems to cause a whole lot of problems, you know. Um, there are people who are sure that other people should be condemned or that other people's practices are sinful. And the way that they know so is because the Bible says so. But really, all they see in the Bible is themselves. They just see their own interpretation of it. And so they look in the Bible for what they want to see, and then they see it. Or they look in the, the experience for what they want to see, and they see it. Facts mean certain things in some places and other things in different places. And for some people, it's just polyester on an iron. And for some other people, it's the face of Jesus and them um, feeling assured. So it's, it's really an issue because, you know, as a progressive Christian, I want to say, you know, other people can believe what they want to believe. Um, and that's all right. But somewhere deep down, I have to ask myself the question, when I say other people can believe what they want to believe, somewhere in parentheses, aren't I saying... Um, because I know they're wrong and I'm right. I mean, really, if I thought another viewpoint was just as good as mine, why wouldn't I already have that viewpoint? And then, of course, that brings issues of context and community in there. And so I really don't feel like I can end this so what with a real good um, statement. But I do have that question, I'll say it again. What would happen to the world if some of the things that we say we're sure about, but we're not really sure about, we started instead to say, you know, it seems to me that this is the case. What would happen?